Well, we continue in the book of First Samuel. Now, let me ask you a question. What does the word if mean? Well, the word if is a phrase that we would use to say that there's a prerequisite. That is, something must happen in order for something else to happen. If you go to the grocery store, I'll bake you some brownies. <laughs> uh, if is a conditional statement. And we find it in the scriptures 1,624 times. 1,624 times the word of God says to us, if you do such and so, or if you stop doing such and such. You might say, well, maybe that's all Old Testament stuff. <laughs> and I submit to you that, that out of the 1,624 times the word if is used, 989 times it's used in the New Testament. Now think about how many words more there are in the Old Testament than there are in the New Testament, and then consider the fact that more than half of the word if are found in the New Testament. Well, we're studying the Old Testament today, and the word if comes up in verse 3 of chapter 7, but let's take a fast look at uh, verse 5, uh, chapter 5 rather. Uh, the Ark of God uh, has brought about uh, great problems for Dagon and for the Philistines. And uh, even though they thought they were successful by taking it, uh, the Lord showed them that uh, his presence is more than they can handle. And we found out the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we entered into chapter 6, um, recognizing all of the movement of that ark and uh, how it was returned to the Israelites. And in chapter 7, uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, The ark kept in Kirath Jiren. Uh, and we're going to show you a map in just a minute or two, some of the key cities that we're talking about. And we see that Eleazar's son, kept it there in Kirith Jiren uh, for uh, 20 years as Israel lamented, L-A-M-E-N-T-E-D. What does lamented mean? Well, it's sorrow. Uh, it, it means uh, to have remorse. It, it means uh, that uh, they're suffering. Uh, and they lamented over their sin and over all that had happened and all of the lives that had been lost. But we come to verse 3 of chapter 7, and it says that Samuel said to the people, If, there's that word, you return to the Lord and remove the foreign gods and serve him alone, he will deliver you from the Philistines. Now he didn't say that uh, they would have an easy time of doing that, but... He just said that that's what would happen if if they would return to the Lord with all of their hearts and they would remove the foreign gods and serve him alone. Then they would be delivered from the Philistines. And uh, so we see this big word, if. Well, in verse 4, it tells us they did. They took the Baals and the Ashrofs and they destroyed them. They took them down. Uh, they returned to the Lord and uh, he asked them to gather in verses 5 and 6 to... Uh, Mizpah, and again in this map you'll start to see uh, not only uh, where the ark was kept in Kirith Jerem, but you'll also see that uh, where they gathered in Mizpah and they fasted and prayed and confessed. In verses 7 through 11, the Philistines heard how they had all gathered in Mizpah and uh, they weren't afraid of the Israelites because they had defeated them so many times before. So they decided to come down and take advantage of this gathering. And uh, the Israelites asked Samuel to pray. And he did. And the Lord answered his prayers because the Lord thundered and confused the Philistines. And as a result, even though the Israelites were afraid of the Philistines and the Philistines weren't afraid of the Israelites, 
God with his thundering and his confusing the Philistines, Israel defeated the Philistines in Bethkar. Now, verse 12, key verse, chapter 7, verse 12. Samuel took a stone at Mizpah and he said, the Lord has helped us. Now we're going to come back to that in a minute or two as we learn about uh, some special lessons today. But remember verse 12, the Lord has helped us. That's after the victory. Verse 13, uh, the Philistines stopped coming into the Israeli territory. There was a time of peace on the days of Samuel and uh, the Lord restored the land that had been taken by the Philistines from Akron to Gath and there was peace in the area and Samuel continued to uh, be the prophet in the area of uh, Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and Ramah and again you see these on the map and uh, it is at Ramah that he built an altar. Now Having looked at that map and seen the map that we had before of the area that, remember, we drew a circle in about a 30-mile radius, uh, what do we learn about all of this? Well, first of all, there's a progression of true repentance here. The first part is the one that we looked at before, and that's the lamenting, the prayer, the sorrow, the, uh, the confession that goes on in chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. Then there's the removal of idols and you say well I don't have any graven images in my home or in my car. Well maybe something else has become an idol in your life become more important to you than God. Fishing, hunting, mate, uh, who knows what what has become a God in your life and has become more important than God himself. And so they had to have a time of lamenting, a sorrow, and they had a time of taking those idols out of their lives. Then in verse 5 and 6, there was a fasting and a confession of their sins. And in chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, there's prayer. And that means do what you can. Do what you can and trust God. Now let's go back to verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and named it Ebenezer. Thus far the Lord has helped us. I think that's important that we remember. Number one, thus far. It's one day at a time, one battle at a time that we win as a Christian. But also I want you to look at the word that not God delivered us although he did, but he helped us. God expects us to do what we can. Uh, I think it's important for us to remember that we don't just sit back with prayer and fasting. We do what we can. They had to remove the idols and they had to do the battle. We have to do what we can and the Lord will take care of the rest. In verses 13 through 17 it says, there was victory and peace. How do you have victory and peace in your life? Well, you lament about your sin, you prayer, fast, uh, you, you build altars unto God, but you do what you can, and then the Lord will help us. That's my thought for the day. God bless you and have a great day. can you be sure you're going to heaven? My son said I should never end a message without telling people how they can be sure they're going to heaven. You can find it easily in just a few verses in the book of Romans. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is anything that's displeasing to God. We all sin every day. My unclean thoughts, a quick answer to someone that's inappropriate, uh, whatever it might be, we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. And we know that the wages of sin are death. Romans 6.23 tells us that clearly. The wages of sin are death. We're all guilty of sin and we all deserve death. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. That's it. That's, that's exactly how God showed his love. He allowed us to see that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, died for us and rose again to prove that he had the power over death. Now watch this. How do we obtain this? It's one thing to know it. You can have it here in your head, but not down in your heart. You know, here's how we obtain it. If we confess and believe in our heart, God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And it says believing it's considered righteousness, not our own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. With our mouth, we confess. And it says, and, and when we confess, it results in salvation. In verse 13, it goes on and says, whoever will call upon the Lord shall be saved. So if you've confessed your sin and said, yes, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that you died for my sins. I'm going to turn from sin and self and to you and to you alone then you can know for certain, if you really meant it, really meant it, then you know that you have eternal life in heaven. I hope that you've prayed a prayer similar to that, that you've acknowledged Christ as your Savior, that you've invited him into your life to be your Lord and your Master, that you've turned from sin and self and received him to be the Lord of your life. And that's my prayer for you. Remember, at the end of this clip, there's an opportunity for you to see the last lesson that we had and also a clip that says how you can have peace in a broken world with the three circle illustration it's a wonderful witnessing tool to share with others if they don't know christ as savior and to see how god fixed a broken world god bless you and have a great day